Our guest speaker, Kat Lucas, is the Outreach and Communications Coordinator with Ontario Streams. She has a BSc, a Master of Environmental Science, and a Certificate of Community Engagement. Kat is an experienced science communicator, and she's excited to share her passion for environmental stewardship with you tonight. Kat, welcome. All right, thank you, Bernadette, and thank you to Aurora Public Library for having me here tonight. Uh, I have a presentation that I will be sharing uh, some information about our local species at risk in Aurora. And I'll be sharing what Ontario Streams is doing to help these species at risk and their habitat. And then we'll finish off with ways that all of us can make a positive impact on the environment around us. Uh, as Bernadette said, you can pop your questions in the chat box. I will hold uh, to answer them until the end. Uh, and this is being recorded, so you'll have it forever on YouTube uh, if you're ever interested in watching it back. I would like to start with a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that the land Ontario Streams works on is the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, and many, many more. We know that Indigenous peoples, they were the first stewards of the land, the first caretakers of the land. And hopefully tonight, as we learn more about the animals who live near us and their habitats, we can reflect on how we can also be great environmental stewards and protect land and resources and animals that we have nearby for years and years to come. Ontario Streams, maybe you've never heard of us before. It's pretty likely. Uh, we are a small environmental charity based out of Aurora, and we lead habitat restoration work all across the greater Toronto area and beyond. Our mission is to promote the protection and rehabilitation of Ontario Streams, rivers, and wetlands through education and community action. So tonight, having this presentation here with you tonight, we're really trying to work on that education part of our mission, teaching you more about the local environment and how we can all really um, protect it and act as stewards for this sensitive aquatic habitat that we're so fortunate to live near. To give you a little more background about Ontario Streams, here are some highlights uh, from the past year. We were founded back in 1996, uh, so we've been at it for quite a while, uh, and these are a, a good idea of the, the, to act, of the actions that we get through in a given year. Uh, so last year we collected 186 and a half garbage bags full of litter uh, from our near stream habitats. We planted over 6,000 native trees and shrubs, we built 45 habitat enhancement structures, which I know is a really vague <laughs> term, and we'll get into it a little bit more, but it's basically uh, a structure that we built in the water to help improve the habitat. We removed 26 detrimental in-stream blockages. So sometimes in our urban rivers, we get areas where a lot of woody debris, such as sticks, twigs, branches, all gather in an area. And and fish can't get through these blockages anymore. So we go in and we pull those pieces out so that the fish can keep moving. We do a lot of education and community action, of course, as part of our mission. And last year we had 557 community volunteers come out to our stewardship events. And we saw about another thousand through virtual programming so, such as this. Uh, and then we also remove invasive species. Uh, in this case, 0.7 hectares of common buckthorn will, were removed and we'll get into that a little bit later too. But as you can see, we're also a small team. Uh, we've got four full-time staff, two full-time contract staff, one part-time contract staff. And then in just a few weeks, we'll be hiring on six seasonal staff to help us with our habitat restoration work. So uh, thinking now about what sort of animals we've seen in our own neighborhood, maybe you can take a moment and just reflect, uh, maybe you've been on a walk recently, enjoying the outdoors, and you've seen some sort of living things or animals in your own neighborhood. Well, here in the greater Toronto area, we've got over 1,000 species of animals, uh, everything from beavers, which we don't often think about in our urban centers, uh, but there are definitely beavers living in Aurora and York region. We've got lots and lots of insects, probably uh, close to a thousand of those species alone are all insects, uh, so lots of variety there. 
We have coyotes as well as foxes. And again, there's lots of reports these days uh, that people are seeing these, these coyotes and foxes a little more often in our neighborhoods. Uh, often <laughs> they are a little scared of humans, but we've been inside the past two years. So they've gotten a little more brave, a little more adventurous checking out our neighborhoods. We also have turtles uh, right here in the greater Toronto area. Uh, in Ontario, we've got about eight species of turtles that we find here uh, and we'll get into two of them today. And then we also have many different kinds of birds and it's that time of year where we're starting to see some of those migrating birds returning to us, a uh, real sign of spring. But also here in the greater Toronto area, we have about 50 species at risk. And a species at risk, it's a designation, either provincial or federal, uh, that looks at how close a species is to extinction. Uh, so how close a living thing is towards being gone forever. Uh, and unfortunately here in the GTA, about 50 species that we have uh, are on their way to extinction if we don't help them out uh, in some way or another. Tonight, our focus is going to be on aquatic species at risk. So animals that live in or near the water, uh, because at Ontario Streams, that's our, our focus, of course, helping these aquatic water habitats uh, to help these species that live in and near the water have a, a better chance here in the GTA. So on the top left, we have red side dace, uh, and we will spend some time chatting about them. In the top middle, that's a Jefferson salamander, and we will also talk about them tonight. Top right are barn swallows. Uh, they are a bird that is losing their habitat. They used to live uh, and make their homes and their nests in barns, uh, but we are losing a lot of our agricultural areas these days to more development, more suburbs. Uh, and unfortunately, they're having a hard time finding a good place to build their nest. The bottom left is an Acadian flycatcher. Again, they're losing their habitat. Uh, so they are someone that would be eating a lot of bugs for us. And I, many of us aren't too fond of bugs. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have those birds around uh, if we're, we're a little not so keen on bugs. Uh, the bottom middle is, of course, a monarch butterfly. Uh, and they are one that migrates. We know they're on their, uh, they're starting to, uh, I guess, slowly uh, around this time of year, we're going to start seeing some eggs and, and later some caterpillars start to pop up. And then in the bottom right, we have a snapping turtle who we will talk about tonight. So to start things off, we have a red side dace. And this is uh, called this name because it has red on its side. And dace is just another word for a small fish. So they are a kind of minnow. They only get to be about 10 centimeters or so long as an adult. They uh, live right here in the greater Toronto area. About 90% of their population in Ontario lives here in the greater Toronto area. And of course, they lived here long before we started building all of our homes, our schools, our shopping malls, all of that. Uh, so unfortunately, our human uh, presence here, our human activities, has caused some problems for the red side dace. They need clean, cold, and clear water to survive. And unfortunately, here in the GTA, we're not finding that very often these days. Uh, they really are not tolerant to pollution. So as soon as we start seeing chemicals or contaminants or even sediments in the water, things like sand and soil, that can really affect these guys. And that is because they really rely on their vision to catch their prey. And they are the only minnow in Canada who will jump up out of the water to catch uh, the things they like to eat, which include flies and mosquitoes. So I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of mosquitoes. Uh, so we really wanna keep these guys happy and healthy to keep eating those mosquitoes for us so they don't bother us uh, while we're outside in the summer. So to help the red side dace, things we need to do is avoid littering, right? They don't want any sort of pollution or contaminants in their habitat. It's also helpful to have lots of plants overhanging uh, the, our local rivers because it adds shade to keep the water cool. And these plants also create places for these mosquitoes and flies uh, to gather and relax, uh, which brings them closer to the river and closer for these red side dace to eat. 
So we do have a little video here of red side dates. You can try to spot them here. This was actually taken in the Rouge. Uh, so nice local river here. Let's see. Oops, all right, the video is maybe not queued up tonight, uh, but it's there, I promise. Uh, I'm having some technical issues on my end uh, for the past few days, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but here we have Atlantic salmon, and Atlantic salmon are another one of our species at risk here in Ontario. Uh, and they are uh, have actually been considered locally extinct or extirpated for over 100 years. When the first settlers came here uh, back about 150, 200 years ago, uh, they very quickly changed things. They saw all these Atlantic salmon and they overfished them as well as they built dams and barriers uh, to create um, an issue for the salmon who are migrating. They can no longer get where they need to go to either eat or to, um, to breed and spawn. And their life, so their population hasn't been able to recover over the past hundred years. Uh, so unfortunately, they are, are not doing very well here. Though, of course, many of us have eaten Atlantic salmon before, so we know that they are not totally extinct. Uh, we can, of course, still get them on the coast in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, still lots of them out between Newfoundland and um, uh, in the other side of the ocean uh, over in Europe. So lots still in the ocean. However, we used to have a very unique landlocked population in Lake Ontario, and that population really doesn't exist anymore. However, it is some good news out there is that there are conservation organizations working to bring back the Atlantic salmon here in Lake Ontario. So Ontario Streams, we are working with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, the Toronto Zoo, as well as the provincial government to restock the Atlantic salmon, which means to uh, add more uh, into our local rivers so that they will grow up. And one day these adults will be able to continue the populations and keep rebuilding. Got some more videos here, but I have a strong feeling they're not gonna work either. No. All right, we'll keep moving. Oh. oh, no. Sorry about that. Uh, but here we have a Jefferson salamander. And the Jefferson salamander are considered one of the most at risk species that we have here in Ontario. Uh, there are, are two main reasons that they are this close to extinction. Uh, one is because of climate change. Jefferson salamanders, they go through a life cycle. They are, uh, am they are amphibians, so they spend part of their life in the water and part of their life on land. And they are, are very picky when it comes to finding a good spot to lay their eggs. And they will lay their eggs in the water so that, that first, after these um, the eggs hatch, they spend that first chunk of their life in the water and then they go off to land as adults but they are looking for a really good spot to lay their eggs uh, and help out their, get their little babies ready for success. And that means they are, are gonna be searching around for a while, trying to find a, a perfect little breeding pond. And usually these ponds, we call them vernal ponds, and they do not have water in them year round. So as the snow melts in the spring, as we get lots of rain in the spring, it creates these ponds in low laying areas in our forests. And this is where the Jefferson salamanders, as well as many other amphibians, will lay their eggs. However, with climate change, uh, we're seeing a lot more uncertainty here with these extreme weather events. So we're either getting a lot more precipitation, a lot more snow, a lot more rain uh, that could change the characteristics of these ponds. And on the other hand, we could be getting a lot less uh, of precipitation and ending up with droughts and possibly not seeing these good quality breeding ponds anymore. The second reason that Jefferson salamanders are endangered is because as they are looking for these good places to lay their eggs, they often have to cross the roads, which leads to the risk of road mortality, uh, which is a fancy way of saying getting hit by a car. Uh, and unfortunately, 
again, they used to live here for many, many, many generations before we uh, started building up the greater Toronto area. Uh, and so after we came and started building all of these roads, schools, homes, all of this, uh, our, our human development has now caused uh, issues for these little guys moving around. Uh, in the past, they could have gotten where they needed to go and not worried about crossing any roads. However, now they do have roads to cross uh, and they're having a hard time now getting to where they need to go and, and doing that safely. Ontario Streams, though, we were just awarded a nice grant of $80,000 uh, to help uh, build a new eco passage for Jefferson salamanders in York region. Uh, and an eco passage is basically like a tunnel under the road. And we put fencing along the roadside to help funnel them right into this little eco passage, right into this tunnel, so they can safely cross under the roads and avoid getting hit by cars. Uh, so we are doing this eco passage as well as doing some research, watching these salamanders move and, and making sure that we're placing the eco passage in the right location. And with this grant, we are also going to be helping improve their breeding habitat as well. Uh, so some good news here uh, on how we are, are going to be helping this very, very endangered critter. Oh, we might get so, oh, there we go. Uh, nice to get one of these videos working. And of course, it's the cutest one. Uh, but you can see they have just such short legs uh, and such low lying bellies that they are very slow when crossing the road, unfortunately. Uh, they are not moving quickly at all. They migrate at night. Uh, and of course, uh, if someone is driving or in a car, uh, you are not likely going to see this little guy only about 12 to 20 centimeters long uh, in the dark on the road, uh, which just puts them that much closer to, to uh, that risky situation. Uh, then we've got Blanding's turtles here. Uh, so these ones, again, a really cute animal that we are so lucky to have here in the GTA. Uh, but the Blanding's turtles, they are often called the turtle with the sun under their chin. Uh, they've got that bright, bright yellow throat. Uh, so they are, are very distinct. Uh, you are not likely to mix this turtle up with any of the other turtles that we have here in uh, York region or in Ontario. They're a medium sized turtle as adults. They can be about 30 centimeters long. In addition to this bright yellow chin, something else that makes landing turtles really unique is that they have a hinge on the bottom of their shell, also called the plastron. And when we think about the turtles that we've seen in cartoons who can pull themselves all the way inside and stay safe, uh, we know that doesn't always happen in real life. Uh, <laughs> most turtles can't pull themselves uh, and get themselves really, really tight in there. However, a Blanding's turtle, because it has a hinge, it's actually able to kind of close this uh, gap from their top shell to their bottom shell uh, and in order to actually give themselves that much more protection. Uh, so very unique for a turtle to do that, especially when we think of a snapping turtle, uh, they are, too big, their body is too big for their shell. So they actually can't pull themselves all the way in, which is why they've developed that defense mechanism to snap uh, and bite uh, instead. So with the blanding turtle, they don't need to have that, uh, that defensive mechanism because they can get pretty close to being almost entirely uh, inside their shell. Blanding turtles, though, they are also highly at risk and there are lots of organizations trying to help them out. Uh, but their main threats are really, again, that destruction of their, their habitat. They need wetlands to survive. And like many of our other at-risk species, they are pretty picky. Uh, so they are, are not going to as easily find a, a second-rate place to live. Uh, so they need really nice wetlands. And with all of our turtles, it takes a very long time for them to reach um, maturity. So it takes them about 14 years uh, before they can actually lay their eggs and, and reproduce, which is a, a long time to avoid being hit by cars, avoid predators, uh, as well as avoid being poached. Uh, as I said, these guys are super cute. And one of the, the threats that they face is that someone out on a walk might come across this cute little turtle and say that would make a really nice pet. 
uh, and they could scoop it up, take it home. Uh, that would be very illegal and <laughs> big, big fines if you were to take any of these uh, species at risk home. So don't do that, please. Uh, we need every last one of them out there in their native area so that they can contribute to that population. One of the organizations that are, are working hard to help the blanding turtle is the Toronto Zoo, and they have a program called Adopt a Pond with a Head Start program where they will uh, collect little blanding turtles and raise them for about two years in a little turtle boot camp uh, and keep them protected and in a natural state uh, for those first two years and then release them out into the wild. Uh, so that really is giving them just that little extra chance uh, to survive uh, because with any baby animal, it really is that first little bit of their life when they are so vulnerable, uh, so much more likely to get eaten by something, so much more likely to, to not do so well during extreme weather events. So being able to keep them safe for that first two years, we're really increasing that uh, chance that they will continue to, to survive out in the wild. So now that we talked about all of these different animals, let's think about why we should care about the nature around us. Uh, we should be caring so that we can have these wonderful uh, species at risk get uh, moved down on the list and, and become uh, one that is not listed as at risk. That is really, of course, the goal uh, to protect our local wildlife. Uh, but in terms of thinking about how it benefits us to protect nature, uh, while well, time in nature is proven to reduce stress, improve memory and attention span, boost immunity, energy levels and creativity, improve our physical fitness and coordination and so much more. Uh, so we really want to be thinking about what we can do for the nature around us, especially possibly in this last two years. Uh, many of us have found uh, a lot uh, of extra time to spend in nature and really appreciate the local wildlife that we have. Uh, so we should always be thinking now about what we can do to give back. But let's think about what Ontario Streams is doing. As I said, we're an environmental charity. Our mission is to try and help our local aquatic environment. Uh, so I'll showcase a, a few of the different stewardship actions that we are taking. And then of course, we'll finish things off with things that we all can do to help. So one thing we do is we fix up habitats. Uh, so we are always looking for new ways to improve local habitats. Uh, on the left here, well, in both pictures, is before and after, uh, but this is at a cattle farm in York Region. And at this farm, this is a creek that is known to have red side dace. Again, that's our little endangered minnow uh, that eats mosquitoes for us, uh, and they, they need our help. So we want to make sure that their river is clean, cold, and clear. Right? We said they need those things to survive. So at this farm, the cows, uh, they, had a lot, they had a lot of free range, uh, which is great for these cows. But every time they walked through the river, they would stir it up, uh, the, the sediment, that soil and sand at the bottom of the river. And we said that the red side days they need to see to catch their prey. So when the cows walk through the river, they made the water all cloudy and murky, and that's not great for the red side days. So here we worked with the landowner and we helped install a bunch of fencing to limit the access to the water from the cows, uh, but still gave them access, of course, to the water, but just we were limiting how, how frequently and how much access they could have to the entire river um, length here. So we installed this fencing and then we also have planted lots and lots of native uh, plants along the riverbank here. And these plants, they are creating shade in the, in the long run. They're pretty small right now, uh, but they will keep growing and create shade. The roots of the plants will help filter and clean water as it moves underground. And the roots will also hold onto the, the, the bank and the soil so that the, the, um, the river bank can stay nice and stable. Uh, we don't want to see them crashing in. That's not great. Uh, so we have those roots in there to really hold in the soil. Uh, last year, we planted um, about 
300 plants. So we're up to about a thousand plants now along this little stretch here on the farm. And uh, there's more work going to be continuing to be done. Uh, so just between this left photo, the before and the right photo, the after, that was only three months uh, between those two photos. So you can see immediately, uh, especially just looking at the lawn and the grass, having all of this new variety of plants right along the riverbank is really, really helpful to keep a habitat healthy. Uh, compared to just lawn, uh, our grasses, like this, our front lawns, the lawns that we see in our communities, that has really short roots. Uh, so it's not actually that great at holding it onto that soil on our riverbank. So we want really diverse native plants uh, along our rivers instead. We also help fix habitats by addressing erosion. And erosion is what happens uh, when we have a lot of rain, a big rainstorm in an urban area. We have so much impervious surfaces, which is any place that the rain wouldn't naturally get back into our ground. So we're thinking about things like pavement, sidewalks, parking lots, roads, all of those places where it stops the water from getting back into the ground. So in our urban areas, we have so much of that pavement. And instead, when it rains, all of that water goes into our storm drains and our sewers, where it's then connected to our local rivers. The water is moving very, very quickly, kind of like a, a power washer, and it just carves out our, our banks in our rivers. Uh, so let me pull up my little laser pointer here and show you that we've got quite a bit of erosion through here. So we see where it's dark and, and shadowy. That should be filled with soil uh, and be a nice strong riverbank. However, because of all of that fast moving water, it carves out our riverbanks. So what we do at Ontario Streams is we come in and we want to refill that area. And that often looks like putting Christmas trees, donated uh, live Christmas trees, into these spaces and securing them uh, along the bank. Uh, when we do this, we are creating little hidey holes and spaces for this sand in the soil that used to be in the water uh, and used to be in the banks, um, used to be in the banks, but now in the water. And that's not great, right? When we think about uh, looking at a river and it's got that chocolatey milk color, that's not necessarily unhealthy and it's not necessarily uh, chemicals or toxic or anything. It's just all of that sand and soil used to be in the riverbank. And in a, a healthy system, that'll, uh, that will settle in a few days. However, it doesn't always have somewhere to resettle in our urban systems. So when we put these Christmas trees in here, there's lots of little spots for the sand and the soil to resettle. Uh, and then slowly over time, this will fill in. So here we've got some pictures. Uh, we see on the left, this is a, an unhealthy riverbank. We're seeing a really sheer cliff there. And that's not great because it's just over time going to continue to collapse on itself. So in the middle, you see that we have taken a bunch of trees. Uh, sometimes we use those donated live Christmas trees, but sometimes we also use invasive species trees, such as Manitoba maple or common buckthorn, and we'll stick those in the bank. So we're kind of doing two birds with one stone, getting those invasive trees out of the local habitats and sticking them in the riverbanks. And then over time, we see that this bank has an, a nice soft slope. Uh, it's been filled with sand and soil, and we've got a bunch of natural wildflowers just popping up here, uh, which is great to see. It means that there's enough sand and soil now in this new uh, structure. This is our habitat enhancement structure, uh, and it's being refilled just naturally. Uh, sometimes we will come back and, and plant uh, willows and, and grasses in here to help, uh, but often they do this on their own. Uh, so it's not something that we need to really interfere with beyond that initial structure. I do see a question. Um, as a conservation charity, do you have to get permits to change the riverbanks like a general community member? Uh, so yes, we do get permits for our work. Uh, we uh, 
our <laughs> that's, that's part of our, our project planning. Uh, we do get permits uh, from the local conservation authorities, as well as provincial government and federal government uh, when working in areas where there are species at risk, such as these red side days, we do need prior approval to be there um, because we will temporarily be in their habitat causing a disturbance uh, by working there and, and enhancing the habitat. So we do need to get those permissions ahead of time for sure. Uh, a really good question there. Uh, do you get it fast tracked? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I would say that. Uh, it is just something that is part of our, our, um, our yearly project planning. Usually in January and uh, February, we're putting in uh, all of our approvals uh, to get our permissions. And then by <laughs> this time of year, uh, before May, when our, our seasonal staff start, uh, we get those uh, the feedback on whether or not we've gotten permission or whether we have to make updates to our project plans. Uh, and then we're able to move forward from there. Let's do one more. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. Feel free to keep asking questions in um, the chat as well, and, and we'll have some time at the end too if we want to get uh, anything else out of the way too. Uh, so another thing that we do at Ontario Streams is wetland creation. Uh, so we are looking at areas that would be good candidates for a wetland and actually building them more or less from scratch here. Uh, so in this case, we are looking at uh, Newberry Park, which is in Richmond Hill, uh, near Bayview in 16th-ish, uh, and here back in 2007, uh, it used to be a, uh, a sports complex. They built this sports complex back in the late 1980s, uh, and this runs directly over the Oak Ridges Moraine. And it likely was not a great place to build uh, a park here just because of there's, there's a lot of natural upwelling of groundwater uh, right in this area. Uh, so unfortunately, by 2001, the soccer field and the baseball diamonds were unusable because there was just so much natural water upwelling and just causing constant flooding uh, throughout the sports field. So between Ontario streams, provincial government, York Region and, um, and Richmond Hill, we decided we've got to change something here. Uh, and the uh, opportunity arose to build a wetland uh, here instead. So by, uh, by 2018, we've got a beautiful wetland here. Uh, and this is a really great space for all of our, our natural local wildlife um, compared to having the sports complex with, uh, with all of that turf. Uh, we're now seeing really nice wetlands uh, for lots of different living things, birds, turtles, um, lots, lots of, of things here. Uh, so you can see another before and after picture here. Uh, again, we've got these soccer fields, these baseball diamonds that stories go that they were just constantly flooded. Uh, no way that you could safely play on them. Uh, and then we've got the picture on the right here, the after picture, this was just taken last year. We see so much natural plant life here uh, and just able to support so many different urban uh, wildlife that uh, normally wouldn't have a, a place like this, uh, at least not here uh, in, in such an urban area. Uh, and then we've also done some wetland restoration, which is when we have an existing wetland that needs some help. Uh, so here uh, we are at Rouge Marshes and the work that we did uh, began in 1998 and um, lots, of, lots of big changes here. We helped with regrading the shoreline, helped uh, with some exclusion of nuisance wildlife such as geese and carp. Uh, we removed invasive species as well as garbage, planted lots of native uh, wetland species. We installed bird nesting boxes, basking logs for turtles, lots of habitat uh, in, enhancement structures there for our local wildlife. So um, you may have visited this area before uh, and maybe you recognize it a little bit. And uh, right now they're actually doing some work down in this parking lot. Uh, again, this is just down at Rouge Beach. 
and they're working on uh, reducing the size of this lower lot uh, so that we can get a little bit more um, natural naturalization happening here. And then I was just there, uh, I guess, not quite a few weeks ago now, probably <laughs> over a month ago, uh, back when it was still really chilly out. Uh, we can see even in the winter that it's really colding up down there uh, and still lots of really nice vegetation uh, and lots of wildlife that we can see uh, down in the Rouge marshes. We also remove a lot of garbage every year uh, and often, unfortunately, we're returning to the same sites to keep picking up a lot of the same garbage. Uh, and here in our urban areas, we unfortunately see a lot of illegal dumping where individuals are, are not interested in paying to um, take their trash to the dump, their excess trash to the dump, and so they go find a secluded natural area and they leave it there instead. Uh, so as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, we removed 186 and a half contractor sized garbage bags last year, uh, and we will continue to do that again this year. Uh, but unfortunately, always lots of garbage that we're finding. Uh, so of course, if we can do what we can to A, reduce the amount of garbage we make as individuals, uh, and B, if we can pick up litter when we are out for a walk, uh, that is, that's also a, a really important next step. Uh, we also, have, as I mentioned earlier, we remove invasive species. And one example here is common buckthorn. Common buckthorn came here with our first settlers. Uh, they wanted something that reminded them of home to plant in their new gardens here in Canada. And for many of them, that plant was common buckthorn or European buckthorn. And they, this is a, a smallish tree and it has these berries on them, usually dark purple. And it is a problem because uh, these berries have very low nutritional value. So we have, of course, a lot of migrating birds here in Ontario. And these birds, they really need to fuel up before they migrate down south. And because this is kind of like candy, uh, the birds love to eat it, but unfortunately, like candy, it's not going to be the right kind of fuel. If you think about if you were to run a marathon and you ate a big bowl of candy versus a big bowl of oatmeal, how far do you think you would go? <laughs> how uh, good would you be feeling? Uh, probably not very good. So what we do is we end up pulling out this, co this common buckthorn, getting it out of our, our local habitats, uh, we use it, as I said, in our structures, so that gets it out of the habitat and then also leads to longer term benefits to the habitat by using this in a different way. And then once we pull all this buckthorn out, we come in and we plant native trees and shrubs. Uh, as I said last year, we planted over 6,000 native trees and shrubs generally in uh, um, in the area close to our rivers. Uh, so we're trying to really improve the, these river, near river habitats. Uh, and we are generally planting a lot of shrubs uh, as those are, are going to offer the most benefits since we can't put so many huge trees near our rivers, uh, but these shrubs are, are just as helpful at, again, holding in the soil, keeping that, those river banks stable, cleaning the water as it moves underground uh, and providing shade as well as habitat and food to lots of other species, not just our, our water, <laughs> water species. Uh, so we do help the, the ecosystems as a whole for sure. So now let's think about how as individuals we can help pr protect our local environment. Again, those local species at risk, uh, many of us are, are really keen on thinking about those, uh, those endangered animals that get a lot of attention, things like polar bears, panda bears. Uh, but again, we need to remember that we have species right here in Aurora, right here in York region that need our help. Uh, and there are ways that we, we can really uh, improve how we interact with our environment. Uh, one thing we need to be careful about is uh, what ends up in nature. So, of course, litter, we never ever want to be a litter bug. We don't want to be the kind of person who just throws garbage out in nature. Uh, but beyond that, uh, because of course we all know this, uh, but the next best, best, next best thing is to be uh, someone who picks up litter when we are outside. 
of course, we want to do this safely, avoid anything that looks dangerous, uh, but we do need to do our best to, to get this litter out of the environment before it becomes a bigger issue. Uh, we might have been hearing about microplastics these days, and that's when pieces of plastic, such as a, a water bottle, a plastic straw, over time they can break down into smaller pieces of plastic. And unfortunately, that's going to be even harder to remove from the environment uh, by the time it gets there. So if we see a plastic water bottle, well, it's still a plastic water bottle, that's the best time to pick it up. Otherwise, down the line, uh, it, it's going to be that much harder to deal with. And there are many studies these days showing that these microplastics are everywhere, uh, both in our environment and recent studies have shown these microplastics are in our bodies. Uh, so we really need to be thinking about the future, of course, and doing these small, easy things now uh, instead of worrying about what's going to be happening down the line. I know we really don't want to think about it, even though we saw some of this today, uh, that snow, of course, uh, but we need to think about how, how much road salt we are using. Of course, we want to make sure that humans who are walking are walking safely and not at risk of slipping. Uh, but with our road salt, we need to also think about how, as that snow melts, uh, it carries that salt into our storm drains, into our sewers, which is, are connected to our local waterways, and it's not cleaned before it gets into our local waterways. So there have been studies that show that in places of the GTA, the water is as salty as the ocean, which for our local freshwater species, that does not make them happy. Uh, so we need to think about ways that we can reduce the amount of salt that us as individuals, as well as our municipalities, uh, can use less. Uh, and that often means really reading the uh, guidelines and instructions on these salt products, using as much as we need. And often for one square meter of sidewalk, you only need one tablespoon of road salt. Uh, so really it's, it's so much less than we think. And we also want to consider alternatives. Things like gravel or sand uh, can help create traction, uh, which is going to stop us from slipping, even though it's not necessarily going to be melting the ice. And we want to be careful about what sort of chemicals we might be using in our own homes. Uh, things like cleaning products, uh, when we can, it would be a good idea to look at getting some of those more eco-friendly cleaning products uh, and avoid using those harsh chemicals in our homes because, again, it's connected uh, to our, our local waterways. We, of course, know our three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but we've got two new layers on here now. We have rethink, which is about uh, reflecting on the different activities we do every day, the different products we use every day, and really think about whether those are good for the environment or not. If they are not so good about for the environment, maybe we can think of alternatives, things that, that would be better. We also have refuse, which is about saying no to those things that are not good for the environment. So maybe the next time you go order some takeout and they offer you plastic cutlery, plastic straw, you just say no thank you and you'll wait till you get home. Way at the bottom now, we have recycle. And unfortunately, studies are showing that uh, only about 11% of the things that we put in the recycling bins are actually getting recycled, which means 90% of the things we put in our blue bins are actually ending up in landfill. That is a lot of wishful recycling that we are doing. And it, it's unfortunate, right? We think we're doing the right thing, but it's not getting all the way through this process. Uh, often that is because these things that we are putting in our blue bins are contaminated. Things like peanut butter containers, yogurt containers, they need to be empty and clean before we put them in the recycling, which does add an extra layer of responsibility and chores for us, uh, but we need to do those things in order to get them uh, to the standard to be recycled. The good news is, is that the provincial government has promised us a new blue bin program by the end of this year. Uh, so I am hopeful to start getting some information about this new program that will get us all back on the same page and properly recycling and, and making sure that we are really getting uh, those three R's plus the new two ones really down pat. 
it's also a time when we can think about voting, uh, but we also can vote with our dollar as well and be informed consumers. Uh, so things we can do are, are making sure that we are buying things that align with our personal values. So one thing we can do the next time we're at the grocery store, we can be looking at buying sustainably harvested seafood. And there are apps such as Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Guide, or the Vancouver Aquarium has a guide called Ocean Wise. And both of these will help you make better decisions about the seafood that you're buying at the grocery store uh, so that we are, are buying sustainably harvested um, seafood. We also, again, I'm gonna talk about our microplastics because they are a growing concern for sure. Uh, but what's uh, happening now is that we are learning that every time we wash our clothes, little fibers are falling off. They are going down our drains into our local waterways uh, where they are now being uh, accumulating uh, in the habitat as well as being eaten by fish and birds. This is a problem because these days, a lot of our clothing is made with synthetic fibers. Uh, when we check the label on our clothes and we see things like polyester or acrylic, that is code for plastic. Uh, so again, we have these microplastics in our environment and they are very, very hard to get rid of. Things that we can do is to A, buy less clothing. Uh, I know for myself, my closet is full of clothes. I do not need anything else. I can just keep wearing the things I already have and extend the life of those clothes. Uh, the studies are showing that newer clothes likely shed more of these microfibers. So if we keep wearing the same old clothes over and over again, uh, that's one way to reduce the amount of microplastics we're creating. We're also showing the, the fashion industry that we don't need all of these trendy clothes. And because they try and sell us more and more clothes each season, they're going to be looking at the cheapest way to make clothing. And these days that is using synthetic fibers. Uh, so we don't often see as much cotton or linen because it's easier and cheaper to make things with plastic. We can also buy secondhand when we do feel that need to keep adding to our closet or that need uh, to actually have new clothing or new to us clothing. Again, extending the life of things that are already out there and trying to take pressure off of the fashion industry to keep pushing more and more out. Uh, there's also other things we can do, uh, something that is not necessarily feasible for most people. Uh, you can get a filter uh, added onto your washing machine. It's not cheap, uh, but it is something that can help pull all of these fibers and stop them from getting out uh, down the drain. Or you can buy something called a guppy bag, that's G-U-P-P-Y bag. And it's kind of like a, a delicate bag with a really fine mesh. And you can put any of your synthetic clothing into there. Things like workout gear are almost always synthetic uh, because it doesn't smell very bad and it quick dries, which of course are things we want when working out. But you can throw all of those clothes in there, zip it up, and that fine mesh lets water and your detergent in but it stops the fibers from getting out. Uh, so those are two other things that are kind of next level other than doing those easier things uh, like buying less for sure. And things we always know of course is saving water and energy. The average person in York region is using about 230 liters of water every single day. Uh, and it, sometimes it's hard to really picture that water usage, uh, but it is there, I promise. <laughs> Uh, so something we can consider is taking a shorter shower. A shower of around seven minutes is all you really could possibly need uh, to get what you need done. We also we want to be thinking about when we're doing the laundry or if we have a dishwasher uh, to make sure that we are doing full loads so that we are getting the most out of the water that we are using. We also want to think about saving energy. We know to unplug our devices when we're not in the room, turn off the lights, uh, try and, and reduce uh, how much we are, uh, how much electricity we're using through those very basic things. Uh, it's also a good idea to start thinking about active commuting or active transit, uh, and whether that means walking when you can to things that are nearby, uh, like groceries, um, just considering these sorts of small but 
um, impactful ways that we can reduce our energy consumption. It's also so, so important to keep learning. Uh, so you can check out the Ontario Streams website where we have some of our recorded webinars. Uh, so you can check out some of the other things we've been working on and chatting about. Uh, I've also got two book recommendations here. We've got The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. If you are looking to learn more uh, on a very local scale about the environment here uh, in the Great Lakes region. And then I would also like to recommend Inconspicuous Consumption, the environmental impact you don't know you have. Uh, I thought this was a very um, accessible read. I know sometimes we read or hear about these books about climate change and they are just really dreary uh, and not very easy to read. Uh, but this author, uh, they go through and just say a lot of those just kind of next level steps that are at this point should be relatively easy enough for us to incorporate into our lives. Um, they go into quite a bit about the, that idea of microfibers, um, thinking about what's in our diet, uh, and just kind of taking those next level steps uh, beyond the, some of the ideas I've shared tonight. Uh, I, I know you are here with the Aurora Public Library, but Markham Public Library is, uh, has a two, um, a two session uh, program with the Toronto Zoo's Great Lakes program uh, running tomorrow night and then again uh, part two next week as well. Uh, so again if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, our local ecosystems uh, that would be a, a good one to catch as well. And then I'm hoping that in the future we'll be able to do some more uh, collaborations between the Aurora Public Library and Ontario Streams in the future. Uh, and York Region, uh, your regional municipality has a lot to offer as well. Uh, so they have uh, programs to help plant um, trees or shrubs in your backyard or neighborhood. Um, they do have options for those living in condos and apartments as well, which is really nice to hear as someone who lives in an apartment. I don't have a backyard to plant a tree, so it's nice that they're thinking about uh, many of us with these programs. Uh, and they also offer resources and webinars on their website too. So you might be able to learn some more about the, the municipality through um, this pro these programs. And again, Ontario Streams, we are an environmental charity uh, and we are always happy to have volunteers come out. At this time, we are, are still working with closed groups, meaning that uh, usually these are, are people who know each other in some capacity already school groups, corporate groups, community groups, uh, and we are doing tree planting, garbage cleanup, um, lots of other stewardship opportunities as well. So if you have a group that would be interested in volunteering, uh, feel free to send us an email. And we also, uh, as I said, a charity, uh, we are happy to have any donations come through as well to help support our projects. Um, so you can donate through our website, ontariostreams.on.ca or, uh, through our Canada Helps profile. Uh, so thank you so much for, for tuning in tonight. Uh, we are on social media at Ontario Streams on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And if you do have any emails or questions, you can email us at info at ontariostreams.on.ca.